Father, we come before you and we open up your word asking that you speak to us. We are desperate and yearning for your spirit because our bodies are full of flesh, Lord. I pray that you would break that flesh down today and build us up with your spirit, God. For there's so much you want to do in our life. There's so much that you have called us to. And there's so much that we cannot accomplish without you, God. I pray that you would let your word go forth this morning that all the physical bodies in here, God, myself included, would just be able to get out of the way and hear your unadulterated, pure word. For it is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, God. Please bless your word today in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in Judges, which we went through not too long ago, since Ryan's going through the Old Testament, uh, this guy named Gideon is about to go on this mission against the Midianites. And... You know, when you come to Christ, even when you're in the world, you come across trials, tribulations, tasks, things that you will never be able to accomplish by yourself. And this is one thing that Gideon might have been able to do by himself, but God didn't want him to do it. And we're going to read a little bit in the Old Testament, and then we're going to compare it to the New Testament and see what Paul has to say about it. So let's start reading in chapter 7, verse 1 of uh, the book of Judges. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon. Um, Jeroboam is Gideon's surname. He had conquered the altar of Baal in the uh, last chapter, or a few chapters before, so they kind of called him that, but his real name is Gideon. And all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of Her- the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Let Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hands have saved me. So he said, first of all, there's way too many people here to make it look like a God thing. We're going to have to do away with a bunch of them. God's got a plan. Verse 3. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. You see in a lot of movies where, especially in a Gladiator, where he rides in front of all his men, and he gives them this war cry. And you don't expect people to turn around and just take off and say, ah, I'm just going home. But Gideon did it. Whoever's a sissy, go home now. And these people, they went home. Let's read how many of them went home. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Right off the bat. Let's just chop them in half. 22,000 left. So we got 32,000 people that Gideon is with trying to fight this battle. But, in verse 4, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go with you. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, So God is just using two different ways of drinking to separate these people. Whoever's an idiot and laps up like a dog, that's who we want to keep. Whoever drinks like a smart person and puts his knee down, that's who we want to send away. Let's see how many people leave. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink. So this means that we have 300 people remaining out of 32,000. 21,700 people walked away from this battle. Now, it wasn't like um, Minutemen where, uh, you know, in America, you, you were Minutemen, you were ready to go, and you had to battle in your country on your forefront. They had traveled... They had prepared, 
they, were, they knew they were going to battle. It wasn't unexpected. So here were these people that were geared up, ready to go, traveled all this way, and then said, nah, forget about it, I'm going home. But remember, God kind of set this up too, so he's doing a little work here. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his own place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those three hundred men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Does anybody know how many Midianites were down there? Let's read. Verse 9, And it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid, go down go down to the camp with Purah, your servant. He kind of gave him like a little bit of grace and mercy there. If you're really, really intimidated and you still don't trust me, I'll let you go down there. You can spy on it with your servant Purah, and then we can come up with another plan. And it's so funny because God does that to us all the time. If you are really that afraid of knocking on doors, I'll send a middle schooler with you. <laughs> he gives us all these scenarios on, on chance after chance after chance to be bold for him since he's been bold for us. Verse 11, thank you. And you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pur, his servant, uh, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand on the seashore. They go down there like, holy crap. There's a lot of people. They believe that there was 135,000 uh, Midianites and Amalekites down there. Which means, even if, that, even if they had kept the 32,000, they would be outnumbered 4 to 1. But with 300 men, they were outnumbered 400 to 1. So if every one man killed 400 people, we'd be good. <laughs> Likely... Without God, not so. Verse 13, And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. This guy knew right away. He's like, we're dead. 135,000 guys? No problem. God's about to wipe us out. I'm going home now. And it's funny because God, or this dr dream that the guy had, was not this soldier on a white horse that came in and started burning everything and destroying everybody. It was a loaf of bread that rolled in like a tumbleweed, landed in front of a tent, and then struck it, and the tent fell down. So obviously God is not, um, you know, Gideon is listening to this. He's not hearing that he's this strong, awesome, mighty man. He knows that he just got compared to a loaf of bread. So after this conversation with these people, um, it confirms to him that he knows God's on his side and God has truly delivered these people into his hands. And now it's time to go back and get prepared for battle. Verse 15, And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he had worshipped, he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. A trumpet in one hand, pitchers in another. Inside the pitchers was a torch. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. 
Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, and I, uh, I and all who are with me, then you shall also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp, and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Remember when that guy had the dream, he said, surely this is the sword of, uh, of Gideon. So this is what he wants to shout. And you see how he, he says, this is the sword of not just Gideon, and not Gideon and the Lord. He said, this is the sword of the Lord first and Gideon. He's recognizing what God's doing. Verse 19. So Gideon and the 300 men were with him, came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of uh, of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets, broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon! And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When, 300, uh, when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled to Beth Asiah, toward Zariah, as far as the border of Abel, Mahola, and Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. Later on in the chapter, in the next chapter, they completely destroy them. But how crazy is it that God set up this tactical for you military guys? It was very tactical. They surrounded them to make it seem like there was a lot more men than there was. They were already afraid because this guy probably went around the camp telling them, everybody, what he dreamed, and nobody had hope at all anyway. Um, you see, back then, even though there was a lot of wicked um, tribes, a lot of wicked nations, they knew that God was an awesome, mighty God. It's not like today where we're such a minority, um, we're so discounted for it. You know, Christians today, we're seen as weak, we're seen as minute, um, we are seen as uh, even a broken religion because there's so many different uh, sects of religion inside uh, Christianity. You have Baptists and Everybody looks at that and thinks we're all divided. Everybody who believes in the one true God must be divided. So that breaks us down even more. But back then, they had so many crazy things happening that they, I mean, they truly knew that God was God, even though they weren't living it and trying to destroy all the people and the Jews and Israelites that were. So eventually, they just got destroyed. And Gideon comes out of this thing with courage and um, just in awe of everything that God did. And knowing that he never would have been able to do that without God. Not only would he not have been able to do it, but God purposely put him in a position to where he would never have been able to do it. If he took... 32,000 people and said, we're just going to take on this army. Four to one odds, yeah, that's bad, but not that bad. You know, us guys, you get attacked by four, four guys, you're not going down. You say, I'm going to take out two, three of them, and I hope I get the fourth. That, that's just it. You're not just going to run. So they would have been able to boast about that afterwards. But instead, he said, I don't want you to boast about your flesh and what you can do on your own strength. I want you to boast about me. God, the one true God. And um, I want you guys to now turn to the New Testament. Um, Paul writes a little bit uh, something about these um, that correlates perfectly in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, funny story, I, uh, I came by this week to do some stuff at the church, and I was headed out to feed the lizards at Ryan's, and I always bring my dog because he loves running around out there. 
And so I couldn't leave him in my truck. I was here for a while, so I brought him in. And the first thing he did is he started freaking out. Never been here before. Well, he no, he has, but anytime he's in a place he's uncomfortable, he just freaks out. So nothing's going on. The place is empty. There, he's, he's got nothing to be afraid of. So I come in here, and I sit down, and I start reading. The first thing he does, he comes in, and he takes a dump on the floor. Like, ugh, I, I can't tell anybody that this happened, but I just, I just blew that one. So he takes a dump on the floor. I'm like, great, that's, that's not good. So I clean the poop up, and I was sitting over there where, where Kaz is. I was reading, and the whole time I was sitting there, my dog is just whining. You know when they get that loud voice that's not even, I mean, just a puniest, sissiest little whine, not even a bark. And he puts his paw up on me and just digs his nails in and slowly drags them down. <laughs> because when, I, you know, when you're sitting, you put your arms together usually, and, and he always tries to pull your arm away from your body to get you to pay attention to him. Now, nothing is going on. Nothing is threatening this dog's life. But here he is with his tail between his legs acting like a little pansy just because he's in a place that he's unfamiliar with. And I looked at him. And I was, as I was about to get mad, I had this crazy thought. I said, this is the same thing that we do to God. We're the same thing. I'm my dog, Eli, sitting here whining, pooping in <laughs> the wrong place because I'm so scared of what's going to happen, although nothing's going on. And although I can protect my dog, God can protect us in a much greater, mightier way. What's, what will it benefit to worry and stress out just because we're in a situation, a trial, a tribulation, a place that we've never been in? If you go through the same tribulation every month, what's the point? God wouldn't do that to you because He wants you to get stronger. Let's read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Paul really... Um, makes sense of uh, Gideon looking like a, a loaf of bread and uh, having to rely on God to conquer those Midianites. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who, beca who became for us wisdom from God in righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You see, when you go through something, your glory, especially when you come to Christ, should be in the Lord. There's a few things that should change once you have um, accepted Christ and taken on a new life. In Ephesians, it talks about putting on the new man and being a new creation, and a few things that you're, you should now be, and I, myself, should now be reflecting, is um, the purpose of your trials and tribulations. If you, um, just like Gideon, and uh, I got a perfect example. When Elena and I moved in October, um, we lived in a house in Margate, and, and we... Um, we loved it. I, I lived there for almost five years. It was a great house. And um, we had the opportunity to move. And so many horrible, bad things happened when I was trying to move. I was under a contract selling our house. And I was under a con another contract at the same time, buying a house. So I was supposed to close on house on Tuesday and buy one on a Wednesday. And my smart real estate agent, Chris, told me that wasn't a smart thing to do. He's like, don't, don't put them side by side because they can get a little crazy. And sure enough, I ended up having my house packed up in boxes for like two weeks. And men, don't do that if you're married. Don't pack your house, dishes, kitchen, everything you own in a box and leave it there for two weeks. But if you want to start a 
awesome argument, fight, or anything like that, go home and do it today. Because that will stress your wife out like no tomorrow. They will feel crazy uncomfortable. But the financial class, you know, that security gland he talks about. Women have that security gland, and it doesn't work well when everything's in a box. So um, we were under contract for our house, and the appraiser came out and told us that um, they gave us their, their written appraisal a few days later, and they appraised the house for less than I was supposed to sell it for, a lot less. And I said, that kind of sucks because my buyer already wanted to pay the price that we agreed upon. Now I have to sell it for, you know, and you go to the buyer and you say, hey, they say my house is worth this, but I still want you to pay this. And they're like, nah, I'll pass. I want to pay this. So there's all this extra money that has to come from somewhere, and we don't have it. But I couldn't tell that to my mortgage broker. So he called me on a Friday and said, hey, here's the number that you need to have showing in your bank account. And um, I think I put the phone on mute and screamed or something like that. <laughs> and I got back on with them and said, all right, yeah, no problem. <laughs> We can do that. That's, we got that. <laughs> Pure man's mentality. Yeah, I got it. No problem. And uh, in reality, we were nowhere close to that, nor had we ever seen that in our life. And, but I couldn't tell him that. So uh, I hung up, and you know, I told my wife. She was standing there. What happened? I said, well, I think I actually wrote the number down and slid it over to her. <laughs> and, and she looked at it. And uh, I said, this is what we have to show in our account. And not even did we not have it. Oh, I told him that, well, we have a business and, and uh, we keep a lot of our stuff in, in PayPal. Uh, and if you wait through the weekend, I can show it to you on Monday. And he said, well, I really got to have it today. And I said, well, is there any way that we can wait until Monday? And so he was like, all right, I'm going to call them and you know, see what we can do. We were able to wait until Monday. So I said, baby, we just got to start praying that something's going to happen. We're not going to go to our family or we're not going to sell our cars. And obviously, if we can't buy this house, God doesn't want us to buy this house. So, you know, God will decide whether he wants us in this or not. And so we just spent the whole weekend praying and, and fasting and, and freaking out and not knowing what was going to happen. And not only did I kind of stretch the truth a little bit, but we had been shut down by PayPal. So the funds we did have in PayPal, we couldn't even access. We weren't even allowed to get to them. And if you guys deal with eBay or PayPal or Square or any of those companies, you know that they turn your business off like that. They're like the fire marshal. They'll come out, and if you, you don't pass code and you refuse to do anything about it, they'll just change the locks on your door. And your business is shut down. Well, that's how PayPal is. So we had no access to our funds, nor did we have funds in there for the house if we had access to it. <laughs> so I was definitely in a Gideon position in this trial and tribulation. Well, lo and behold, that weekend was the craziest, busiest weekend by far that we had ever had for our business. And those telephone number figures, um, on Monday, all we know is that on Sunday night we went to bed and they weren't there. And when we woke up on Monday morning, not only were all the funds almost to the dollar there, but we somehow, to this day I still can't tell you, we somehow have access to our PayPal account. <laughs> so they opened up our account and all the funds came in in two days. And so, of course, you know, here I am calling my mortgage broker, yeah, yeah. telling him I got these funds. Yeah. Yeah. But I knew that God had done something crazy with 300 men, 400 to 1 odds. We, we probably had negative odds on that one. <laughs> it was crazy. And we know that God showed up 100%. And after that happened... We had a bunch, uh, you know, a lot more crazy things happen to the sale of our house and the purchase of our new one, but those were like nothing. I didn't even care. I could, I could care less. The, the house I was buying, uh, 
it took the money to transfer like way longer and I didn't even care. I packed everything up in the trailer. I called the guy and said, hey, I'm headed to your house. He's like, I don't have the funds yet. I said, I don't care. <laughs> Everything's in the trailer. My youth is with me. I'm 10 minutes away from your house. Please meet me there. I said, my wife's been freaking out for two weeks and if I get there and you're not there, she's going to come find you and you don't want that. So God showed up and it worked out great. But that's one thing that, um, one perspective and aspect that changed about my life when I came to Christ, because now that whole situation is purpose for His kingdom. Instead of being, oh, life sucks, oh, of course this happened to me, your perspective is now different, and it's no longer about you, what you can accomplish through your flesh and your might. It is now about what God can accomplish through you just using you as a vessel. Another thing that um, should change is your desires. Our desires as Christians should be completely different than before. And if you ask yourself, what was, don't shout out anything here, but if you ask yourself, what's my, what was my main focus, or, or maybe you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, and you're still you know, living the same life you have been, and that's fine, ask yourself, what's your desire? What's your main focus? And before Christ, what was it then? What was the main thing that you strive towards? I asked, um, I asked uh, Pastor Ken, I said, before you came to Christ, what was your main desire? And I've never heard anything, anybody answer anything like he did. He said, I wanted to be the next Noah. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I, I wasn't saved, but I knew that God one day had avenged the earth. That he wiped everybody out. Noah got on a boat and started his own population on the earth. And I said, can you please elaborate a little more? He said, I wanted everybody to die. <laughs> and I wanted to be left alone with a beautiful woman to start my own family on the earth. And I said, uh, I just thought to myself, man, that is not even reality. <laughs> how, can, how can you even think that? And he was just such an angry, angry person beforehand. And he truly, he, he said, fortunately, no one knew. That's what I thought. I walked around and no one knew, but that's what I wanted. Cain Graves, is, he's a, a beast of a man, a deep voice, and, and um, he's just a, a, a Maine man, raised in Maine, and, and um, he's a strong guy. And he desired everybody to die. And that was his desire before Christ. Now his desire is completely different. Completely different. There's a guy, Chuck Missler, I don't know if you, um, I'm sure some of you have heard of him, if you go in Ryan's office, there's a set of uh, audio CDs, and, and he actually um, taught the whole Bible on audio so that everybody could, could listen to his commentary and stuff. He's a great theologian. He was in the, the Navy for a while, and he was so smart, he ended up working for the advisor, the science advisor to the president. He worked for the uh, Joint Chief Staff. Um, he, in 1966, he created the first international uh, computer technology system uh, when he got recruited by the Ford company. He was some like hot shot at, at Ford Motor Company. And uh, he spent years and years doing that stuff. And he flew every high performance aircraft you can imagine. He shot every cool um, explosive you can think of. He was an adrenaline junkie, as he states, and he said, um, this isn't like a famous quote, I just heard him say it in one of his teachings. He said, the most exciting moments in my life are, and this coming from a guy who has done so much politically, military background, and all the adrenaline stuff that he did, he said, the most exciting moments in my life are when God speaks to me. And then he, he went on to say, when God shows me that one verse that I've been waiting for, when He confirms my morning devotion with a Wednesday night study, 
or the Sunday morning teaching or somebody that comes in the store that I meet throughout the day that gives me the same verse that I read or God gives me that thought, that idea, that guidance, that discernment, whatever it is, when you know that God is speaking to you, that's what Chuck Missler considers the most exciting moments in his life. In his life. And if you guys have never experienced that, if all that stuff doesn't mean anything to you, man, you don't know the God that I know because he speaks to all his children as long as they listen and ask. And if you look at your life and say, man, I have, um, my desires have changed. My perspectives have changed. I know that my trials and tribulations are now for a purpose. Man, praise God. I hope you compare them to your life beforehand because they should be opposite. They should be opposite. Now, Pastor Ryan, he doesn't know that uh, I took that quote from Chuck Missler, so I asked him the same thing. And I said, in your words, can you please finish the sentence? I said, the most exciting moments in your life are dot, 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 question mark. And he's out of town, so I had to do it via text. And I didn't know what kind of response I was going to get back. I was hoping it was something that I could use today, but because I asked him, I have to share it with you now. The most exciting moments in Pastor Ryan's life is when he makes his wife laugh so hard she can't breathe. <laughs> that was, uh, but that's why I love my, my pastor. That's why I love my father-in-law. You know, it wasn't some scientific, crazy answer. It was um, his joy, his wife. And that was definitely not a desire uh, before he got saved. And so... Even though it's not Chuck Missler's answer, I put our pastor right up there with everything that uh, Pastor Chuck has accomplished and done, and he loves the more Lord just as much, if not more. And um, I want to read to you guys this, these verses again, because now that we've gone through the different um, aspects of your desires, how they should have changed, and the different aspects of your purposes and goals in life and how God's going to put you in a position on purpose just to bring Him glory. You wonder why you're crying like a dog. You wonder why the situations suck. If they didn't suck so bad, then you would think that you're the man. We would think that we need nothing. That's why the Bible says it is harder for it is uh, easier for a camel to get through the needle of an eye than a rich man to get to heaven. And isn't that true? I was um, I was talking to I met this homeless guy Alvin the other day. I was driving home. My wife said, "Oh, you need to pick up some food on the way." I said, "Okay." So I get home and I say, "She said, where were you?" I said, "I was hanging out with my buddy Alvin." She said, "Who's that?" I goes, "Just a homeless guy I found." <laughs> So this homeless guy was outside LaGrange or something, and so I, I started talking to him. And he's homeless. He used to have a car, used to have a, a life. He was like 35. And you know when you look at someone that's homeless, you can usually tell um, you know, if they've been homeless a long time or not, the way their skin looks, beat up by the sun or not. His skin wasn't raw like that. So I knew that he was telling the truth. Uh, when he said he wasn't homeless that long. He said six months. It might have been longer than that. I don't know. But um, he definitely hadn't been living on the streets for a crazy long time. And um, as I started talking to him, I said, you know, man, I I was homeless before, and it it sucked. I said, I didn't have anything, and um, but my mentality wasn't any different than when I did have stuff. I said, if you get an apartment, are you going to be happier? He said, oh, yeah. I said, if you get a car and a job, are you going to be happier? He said, you bet. He he might have thought I was about to offer him, like, an apartment and a car and stuff like that. I don't know. But he was, yeah, I'm definitely, he was 100% sure about that. And I said, what if I told you you wouldn't be happier at all? He said, dude, you're wrong. (laughs) You're wrong. I'm homeless. I would be happier. I said, you might be more comfortable, but you would not be any happier than you are now. Being content is only 
going to happen when you're in Christ. Because no matter how much or little you have, when God calls you and says, He's going to make you rich, the rich that the world considers rich and the, and the rich that God considers rich is completely different. And although you might have no money, you're, with Christ you're going to be way happier than the dude that does have money. I guarantee you. Because I remember living at home as a kid and then being homeless as a kid. And there really wasn't much of a difference. It was more comfortable at home, but I was still as miserable. Uh, my brain still racked me. And a lot of you guys, go ahead, in your mind, compare your mentality to all the stuff you had or didn't have before Christ. And, and think about it now. Some of you guys, I know your story. I know you have a lot less now with Christ than you did before. A lot less. And uh, you don't care because your life purpose is now different. So, that being said, let's read these verses one more time. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put shame the things that are mighty, a.k.a. the Midianites. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in His presence. No matter how big you are, no matter how much money you got, no matter who you are, nobody should stand before God and tell God that, that you can do it alone. Because you know you can't. And if you don't know you can't, you're in trouble. Verse 30, But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. You know, um, that song, Empty Me, they didn't sing it today, but um, the lyrics to it, Holy Fire, Burn Away my desire for everything that is not of you and is of me. I want more of you and less of me. I love that song because it's, it's so um, humbling and deteriorating to everything you think is good about yourself. I know I'm kind of being redundant about it. You guys can close your Bibles. This is where we're going to close. But after I went through... Um, the trials and tribulations of our business and our house um, the past couple years. Although I don't have kids yet, I say, I'm ready for any trial. Your parents are like, no, you ain't. <laughs> but honestly, what God has done on my behalf alone, it, it, my faith is, is way stronger than it was before. And um, it doesn't even compare and so when I look at people and, and, um, and they have, you know, they don't have the trust or, or faith in Christ yet, it might just be because you haven't gone through some of those things yet. And when you do and when you let God do it and see that God's doing it, you will be stronger. When, um, anybody remember the first thing that happened to the Apostle Paul when he got saved? He was, he was blind for three days. He was blind for three days. As soon as he got saved... God took away his light. Boom, three days, you can't see. One, he'll never forget that. Two, it brought all his attention to what had just happened. Even his friends that stood around him, they heard a loud voice. They were shocked, but they didn't see anything. Well, later on in the book of Acts, uh, Paul and... Um, who was it? Who did he go with? Paul and Silas. Um, yeah, Paul and Silas, I think it was. They went to um, this island, and there was a sorcerer there, and uh, a proconsul. And the proconsul wanted to know what they had to say. But the sorcerer wanted to stop Paul uh, from spreading the love of Christ to this guy. So he went to the sorcerer, and he said, You son of a devil! And he said all these horrible things to him, and then he said, You will have no sight. 
and boom, the guy was blind right away. And so what, Paul, what happened to Paul, as soon as he had gotten saved, God used the same thing, and God, I'm sure when he blinded Paul, he knew he was going to do it. Uh, nine or ten chapters later, Paul was in this island, and, and the same thing that had happened to him, he used on this other guy. And the guy that got blind, it doesn't say what happened to him, but the man that stood there and watched that happen was like, and he said he immediately believed because of what he had seen. He couldn't believe it. So everything you're going through, not only is it for you, but it is for ministry. It's purpose to, to give everyone else some hope when they're going through that horrible trial, that horrible tribulation that they're going through. I guarantee if you guys are going through anything now, there's somebody in the church, whether it's one of our leaderships, our men, our women, there's somebody that can relate give you some scripture and tell you it's going to be all right because God's got your back. But if you try and do it alone, imagine if Gideon has said, you know what, God, I'll take my 32,000 people. I can take on 135,000. He would have got wiped out. God would have had a completely different plan because God's purpose was to be glorified. And he gave Gideon that opportunity and Gideon followed it to the T. And in the end, the Midianites were destroyed, along with the Amalekites. And Gideon died like a, a chapter later, um, and he was buried next to Joash, his, his father. But he lived a good life, and uh, he was able afterwards to say, God showed up on my behalf. The Bible says, God looks to and fro throughout the earth, seeking those whom he can show himself strong on their behalf. If you guys need anything, if you're going through anything, if you have no idea, um, except what I've told today about the God that we serve, please come up here. Our leadership will be up here afterwards to help you. And um, we're a pretty small family church. Anybody that needs anything, we got your back. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are just such a good, awesome, and mighty God. For all the strength that lies on this earth, God, your word says that you hold the universe on your arm. God, and that's how tiny and minute we are. And God, I pray that we would surrender everything to you. That we would surrender whatever is going on in our life, God. That we would not glory in the flesh, but glory in you. And if we have taken credit for things that you have done, God, shame on us. Please, let us give glory to you the one true, mighty, and awesome God. We thank you so much for giving us um, the Sabbath, God. I pray we would enjoy it, Lord.